Hello everybody, here I am again, and again merely from a distance. Sorry that the technology yesterday did not seem to work as it should have for a direct question-answer session after my lecture, but I received a few questions to which I can now try to answer. Now, the first question that I received was, and I quote, how do we account for breakdown in mediated communication? How do we manage breakdown in mediated communication? Now, the answer to that kind of question depends, of course, very much on what it is that you mean exactly by breakdown. There are many different kinds of breakdown that I can imagine. So there is a very literal kind of breakdown in mediated communication that was extensively described by people like Stephen Cushing in a book of his that was called Fatal Words. Now, that book, Fatal Words, was all about the forms of miscommunication that took place between uh, pilots and flight control people and that were responsible for certain types of fatal air crashes. Now, one of the things that he describes, for instance, is the fact that there are many utterances in the language of pilots which can be parsed in a number of different ways. Like, for instance, 2222 is a sentence in response to a question. But depending on how you parse that utterance, it refers to different kinds of things. It can refer to aspects of altitude, it can refer to distance, it can refer to uh, time, um, and so on and so forth. So, okay, communication may break down over those kinds of things, and since these usual, all these elements that I mentioned are crucial elements for how you fly a plane, um, well, because it's all crucial elements, these can have disastrous miscommunication there, can have disastrous, disastrous effects, so it is a real communication breakdown in mediated communication. Now, that's very literal. There are, of course, more metaphorical things that you can imagine. So, for instance, when communication creates unresolved tensions or disputes or controversies, and this happens in an enormous amount of the time on internet and in social media, so where, in fact, everybody can basically say whatever comes to their mind, without listening to what anybody else has to say, and even listening to what someone else has to say, is sometimes difficult because there may be a time lag between an utterance and the response to that utterance, and there may be many things that intervene on, uh, on a computerized um, platform. So one of the exa an example of that was very simply the kind of communication that took place in the follow-up on the Instagram post that was made by Israel Follow, which I talked about briefly in the talk that I gave yesterday. Then there is another type of breakdown that uh, is um, not literal, that is not, you could, it could not even say that it is metaphorical, but it is very pervasive, and I would still want to include it in the category of breakdowns. And that is when authoritative, voice, authoritative voices perpetuate unjustified frames of interpretation. And in the terminology that I use here, you know that I am thinking about ideological processes. Now, there may be authoritative voices that perpetuate unjustified frames of interpretation, and you can find them all over the place. Uh, an example that I like to quote is from an early 20th century history textbook in which you find the following expression, namely, in addition to the wars and the politics which this book is all about, there is also a lot in this book about the works of peace. 
and then they give an enumeration. Industry, trade, colonization of the world. So, colonization of the world is included in the works of peace in the frame of interpretation of the person who wrote this, and the person who wrote this was an authoritative figure, because this was a history textbook, and this was being read by lots and lots of students, and must have had a pervasive effect. Well, this is also the kind of thing that I, if those, if those kinds of ideas are carried along without any further thought in the discourse that is produced, I would also talk about a form of breakdown. Now, in all of those cases, the solution, the only long-term solution, is basically education. So, if you think about the pilot training, uh, well, yes, pilot training can guarantee that a pilot understands that what he or she hears can be interpreted in different ways and can take these differences into account in their interpretation. The second example that I gave, namely uh, <clears throat> the example of the more metaphorical cases of breakdown, as you find them in, in social media, well, education in civility combined with pragmatic insights may help there. Um, because there's such a thing as, well, if you educate people with knowledge of pragmatics, the pragmatics of language use, then one of the things that you can make them understand is that it is not only the case that you cannot say everything that you want to say explicitly, but there is a reverse side to that as well. Namely, if you hear somebody saying something, you also must realize that it is impossible for this person to mean everything that can possibly be implied by what he or she says. And use, using that kind of knowledge as the basis of your attitude in communication can prevent a whole lot of misunderstandings. And then the widest case that I cited, the case which relates to ideology and so on, well, there people can be educated in, into an awareness of the kinds of unquestioned assumptions that are carried along without, uh, without being made explicit in various kinds of discourse. So education basically is the long-term solution, but in order to educate, we must have the right kind of knowledge and for the right kind of knowledge in connection with these kinds of things, well, the right kind of knowledge is a good understanding of the workings of language use. So I think that pragmatics has an important task to play there. Then the second question that I received was, are, the, are there peculiar linguistic characteristics of hate speech? Now, that's a very difficult question to answer, because I, I don't think uh, there are linguistic characteristics of hate speech per se. Um, for one thing, hate speech is a very gradable kind of phenomenon. So it starts already from uh, the, well, from a, re a rhetoric which presents itself as an attempt to just say the truth, just say what you think, as part of the fight which you find in public discourse quite a lot these days, the fight against so-called political correctness. Now, this fight against political correctness or the, or the self-presentation as just trying to speak the truth, well, that is very often an excuse for saying things that are very humiliating, that are very much um, socially destructive. Um, one example that I can immediately think of is the example of a high-ranking Belgian politician who was in fact responsible for things such as the fight against racism, but who literally said, racism is relative. And 
who argued this by saying, well, racism is very often just used as an excuse for personal failure. Now, this person presents herself as trying to just say the truth, but what happens in actual fact there is that the victims of racism are made responsible for whatever happens to them. And <clears throat> so if you talk if you want to talk about linguistic properties of forms and, and the example I'm giving is not a straightforward example of hate speech, but it is the very basis from which all kinds of forms of hate speech develop. Because the people who, who use real hate speech will try to justify their own verbal behavior on the basis of exactly the same kinds of arguments as the ones that this high-ranking Belgian politician gave for saying what she said. Now, <clears throat> so the linguistic properties that are involved are basically to be found at the level of rhetorical strategies. Now, there was a, was a third question that I received, and the third question said, why should we be concerned with mediated communication? What are the basic peculiarities and hence the interests in mediated communication that are not manifested in casual face-to-face -face conversation? Now, again, this is a question to which no absolutely general answer can be given. But the, the way in which I would approach that kind of question is as follows. The first thing to start from is that language, in a very real sense, is action. Well, that's what the whole idea of speech act theory was based on, but speech act theory uh, restricted itself to all kinds of things related to the elocutionary force of individual sentences. Now, language is action at all other levels of structure as well. Now. But looking at language as action, you must realize that there are innumerable kinds of activity types that may be involved, kinds of verbal activity types. And even face-to-face -face, uh, communication is not always the same thing. So there is face-to-face -face communication that can be very simply conversation, but there is also face-to-face -face communication that can be embedded in a very institutionalized context, like, for instance, a job interview. And a job interview must, uh, well, lives, well, is conducted on the basis of expectations that are very different from the expectations and the norms that are surrounding an ordinary day-to-day -day conversation. A job interview, for instance, is the kind of event in which you are expected to, uh, to show your own knowledge and abilities as honestly as you can. But if in a job interview you are asked, well, why is it that you're interested in this job, then you are not free to answer well, I just want any job I can get. No, you have to start saying flattering things about the company in which you want to get your job, right? So, so there are different kinds of expectations involved. And, and so there are, there are thousands of different kinds of activity types, even in the face-to-face -face context. And exactly the same thing can be said about mediated forms of communication. So, and the only thing that mediated forms of communication have in common with each other is that there is an additional medium involved in addition to just ordinary human voice. And this already starts from the use of writing. Um, it goes to um, the use of computers for writing, sending emails, instead of sending letters. And in both cases, there are different norms, different expectations. There is radio interviews and television interviews, and they can, and there, it's not all the same thing either. So some of these events are news interviews. Others are just news shows or shows to court, right? 
And then you have the whole world of social media, which uh, you definitely know much more about than, um, than I do. Now, <clears throat> so to understand what goes on in all of those different types of activity types, well, you really very carefully have to be able to describe the basic properties of each individual one. And <clears throat> since, and okay, then to give a more straightforward answer to why should mediated communication interest us so much? Well, the reason is very simply that with the growth and the further expansion of means of communication, of te communication technologies, well, the mediated communication will be playing an ever more important role in social life. So that's why you should really continue studying these kinds of phenomena. Again, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.